come back. Might need a little bit, just a little more volume. <coughs> I thought we would just open up this afternoon session with uh, just a little more clarity around guilt. As I mentioned guilt this morning, I mentioned ontological guilt. That's, uh, we were talking at the break time, Suzanne was asking to go into that a little bit more because the ontological guilt of believing that you can separate from the source or the creator is is a very intense feeling of wrongness uh, or shame that is projected out over time. You might say it's like diluted over time into little bits and pieces of interpretations of feeling shamed or wrong around an action Carly brought up around behaviors, it's just, that's a projection of this ontological guilt, and... Is that word you're saying? Guilt? No, before that. Ontological. It's, it's like a, it's like a, a, a very core cosmic mistake. So it's not like, when we think of mistakes, typically we think of people make mistakes, but People are part of the projection, and this mistake is an error in the mind about identity. So it's an error of identity, and it comes with a feeling of wrongness, like intense wrongness or intense shame. So I use the word ontological to differentiate between what seems to be Guilt in this world is very much specifically related to I did something that I shouldn't have done or I should should have done something <laughs> that I didn't do or other people. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a person but others have done something that they shouldn't have done or others have not done what they should do or should have done. So you can see that's, the, that's a really good example of the projection of guilt projecting it to form, and projecting it to behavior. And then of course, with that projection comes the attempt to make the correction at the form level. You know, make reparations, um, in a big way sometimes make lots of reparations. Uh, like the sense that I've done the unthinkable or the unforgivable, now I'm forever in your debt. Even the sound of that doesn't sound good, forever in your debt, forever I must make this up to you, there is no end to my apologies, and so on and so forth, but it gets really projected out there onto the form. And so that's why the correction has to be accepted where the problems seem to be. We tend to want to correct behaviors and that can be anything from losing weight, to apologizing, to um, changing our ways in form, but as I was sharing earlier, what you do comes from what you think. And in 12-step terms, even if you stop drinking, you still have a problem, as they say in 12 steps, if you have the stinking thinking. Even if you're a dry drunk, it, it still hurts. Even if you're able to stop the behavior of the drinking, but you still feel sad, depressed, hurt, angry, frustrated, it means, they, they use that term dry drunk, where somebody's like going through the motions, or even somebody is coming to do the steps in form, but they have huge resistance to the higher power, huge resistance to turning their life and will over to, the, to God, to the higher power, to be, to be healed to be shown how to heal. And so that's, these are just extreme examples of trying to correct at the level of form where the problem really isn't, because the, this ontological guilt is in the mind. And it was such a horrific uh, feeling of, of this terrible, horrible guilt that it was pushed out of awareness. So there, now we know where the unconscious mind came from. 
I can't feel that. Oh no, I can't feel with God, no. So it's pushed out of awareness. So in one sense you might say when you think of your mind, the light of truth, who you really are, is in your mind. It's, it has never left. That, that light would not go out. That light is forever. That light cannot be changed. You don't ever have to worry about losing that light. You can seem to lose awareness of the light, but you can't lose the light. But on top of the light is the, this ontological guilt, this horrific feeling of wrongness. So both the light is pushed out of awareness and the feeling of horrific wrongness is pushed out of awareness. And then what we would think of as a person in linear time is like you get little diluted bits of pleasures and pains and joy and sadness, you know, almost like a, throwing a little vial of deadly poison into the ocean. The, the poison's still in the ocean, but you've just diluted it to the point where it's unrecognizable, or mostly unrecognizable, until you get slapped in the face by one of those waves <laughs> when you're not looking. And that's like a little, little reminder, like, oh, it's still, you still believe in it, you, you know, even though it's spread out. And then, what Jesus does in the Course is he raises into awareness beliefs that the ego does not want, it just doesn't want these raised into awareness. Because the more these beliefs are raised into awareness, and the more you actually see the beliefs and the ego for what it is, you just are like, I'm not, I can't believe in that. that. That is not helpful at all. Guilt is not helpful. And one of the beliefs that the ego, in its dualistic world that it invented, are, is the beliefs around pleasure and pain. To the sleeping mind, pleasure and pain seem extremely different. They do seem to be opposites. And so this is part of the ego's trick, because the ego doesn't want to be uncovered and unmasked. It doesn't want the, the game of time and space to be over, so it makes up these dualistic concepts, and it tells you that these dualistic concepts are different, can be told apart, and not only are they different, in some cases they're, they're opposites, and that one should be pursued, and one should be avoided. And Jesus is using his course to undo the deepest ego tricks at keeping the mind asleep, and perpetuating the error of separation. At one point Jesus says, it is impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. That's something that most human beings are not taught. We don't hear that in psychology classes. We don't imagine. Say that again. It is impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. And so, uh, a lot of times, if you listen in twelve-step meetings, the, even the the alcoholics or the ones that are going through this healing process, they will talk about this sick attraction to the drinking sick attraction to the addiction, very mysterious and perplexing, like they've tried to deal with it on their own for, we'll say, months or years or even decades, and they, it's very mysterious, like they're somehow attracted to misery. Sometimes you hear in 12-step groups people saying that, but it's so mysterious because they don't understand it. Well, Jesus is, he's the way shower, so he's here to say, well, let me tell you, about how this is working in your mind, so you can be free of it. And the thing about both pleasure and pain is that they actually are the same, which is very much different from anything in the human experience, but they're the same because they share the same purpose. And remember how he said, purpose is in the mind. So if the world was made by hatred, and all these dualities, and all these seeming opposites were all made up by the ego, then it uses the world and the tricks that it made to maintain the guilt by having the mind constantly attracted to the surface of consciousness. Distractions, addictions, seeking for pleasure, having pain, more pleasures, more pains, and then it basically said, well, you're going to die anyway, so maybe you can have more pleasures than pains, call it a good day and die. But Actually, you don't escape the ego through the death. Uh, there's one part in the Course where Jesus says, the ego will pursue you beyond the grave. 
it's a death wish and it is it's like a Freddy Krueger movie <laughs> it is you can't kill it it you do not destroy this thing you do and you especially can't kill it because if you want to kill it then it's like good 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 this try let's use some of that energy that murderous energy you know because it just <laughs> perpetuates it and strengthens it so of course it's the opposite of what Jesus taught, what Gandhi taught, nonviolence, you know, t turn the other cheek, you know, the ego is is wanting to perpetuate itself, but it needs the mind's belief and the mind's energy to it's like a parasite that if you totally saw the nothingness of the parasite then it would be peace eternal. But we're going now to go inside the parasite a little bit to see what some of its strategies are. It wants to perpetuate guilt. It needs, it feeds upon guilt. It will not disappear as long as it is fed. If you can think of it as like a, a parasite, you wouldn't keep feeding the parasite of guilt if you wanted peace of mind. Uh, that would not be a good thing. So, there is this curious thing called the attraction of guilt. Um, where if you are attracted to it, you don't really see what the attempt is. And so the attraction to pleasure is also the attraction to pain. Because they, are, they both serve the purpose and that purpose that they serve is reinforcing in awareness that the body is real. And think about that, when you have your most pleasureful moments, the, the focal point of that pleasure is the body. When you have your most painful moments, the focus of that pain is the body. As I said earlier, this whole world was made to keep you mindless, and so the more you become aware of your mind, the more you start to experience, I would say even the pains and pleasures, pleasures start to feel more psychological because you're just becoming aware that your mind is the cause, and you also see that, that your thoughts, which thoughts that you invest in, are the ones that are producing your experience. So there's the unholy instant, that time, tiny tick of terror, which is the ego. The more you focus your mind on the unholy instant, you will experience the fear, the pain, the guilt, the, the shame, all the things that you would expect by believing in a, a death wish. If you were objective and you said, wow, if I'm invested in this death wish, then these are the kind of upsetting emotions that I would experience. And if I invest and come closer and desire the holy instant, then the, the peace, the happiness, the joy, the playfulness, the lightness, everything you'd expect of a correction for an error are yours to experience. So ultimately, you know, I used to listen to songs all the time, these musicians would read the chorus, uh, one of them, Do I want the problem, or do I want the answer? Teach only love, for that is what you are. You know, these little jingles, it's like we have Coca-Cola jingles, and you know, I would get these chorus jingles going through my mind, and I particularly like that one. Do I want the problem, or do I want the answer? Teach only love, for that is what you are. That, that says a lot. And there's that want word again that Robert brought up. Do I want the problem or do I want the answer? Wow, thank you God for trying to bring, simplify this in my mind so I can start to see that, that in this moment I have a choice. I am not a victim of the world I see. I am not at the mercy of external forces. I am not at the mercy of the images I see. Literally, in the Bible it said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall overcome the world. We start to learn that meekness actually means strength. And it's the strength of their vision. That's why the, the meek shall in, inherit the world, shall overcome the world, is through their strength of their spiritual vision. And so it starts to point more and more like, wow, that's what this is all about. It's about reaching spiritual vision and seeing the world in a whole new way and relinquishing the old way of, of thinking and the old way of believing and the old way of proceeding. 
And also you're letting go of those old past emotions too, the pain, the suffering. But you also realize that you have to quit falling for this trick about seeking for the pleasure, maximizing the pleasure, minimizing the pain. It doesn't work that way. You maximize the pleasure, you maximize the pain. You minimize the pleasure, you minimize the pain. Now, on face value, on the surface, it can be like, oh my God, what, am I going to have to get a case of Mother Teresa-itis here in the worst way, or St. Francis-itis? Uh, what's wrong with you? I got St. Francis-itis. <laughs> what are you going to do? I'm, I'm, I, hopefully I get worse with it. The I, I, more I get into St. Francis, maybe that, that may be better for my, my mental health. But actually, this is why this is a course in miracles. It's a course in miracle working. It's a course that shows you that as you're willing to allow these miracles to come through you and be performed through you, that you will experience joy. Not pains and pleasures, and not even necessarily an inconsistent joy, but the more miracle-minded you are, the more willing you are to be in alignment with the Source, the more willing you are to be used by Spirit, for the good of the whole universe too. It's not like for just a personal use. This is for the undoing of the personal and for the greater good of the whole. And when you allow yourself to be used as a miracle worker, you strengthen that and you are drawn more toward that by the joy. That's, for me, that was the greatest convincer that when I would just say, okay, use me anyway, use me, I don't care, just just make this be a blessing for the whole universe, then I would experience more and more joy, more consistent joy, and that is something that draws you, literally through attraction, you are attracted to that joy, you are attracted to that happiness. You, you literally say, wow, I can't get enough of this. I, I want to be in my purpose, I want to be in my function, I want to do this for the good of the whole. Would you be able to talk about the pleasure in that? Yes. So, in the Bible we read, and also in the Course, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. God's will is for perfect happiness, but God's will is in heaven. You know, so when people say, oh, it was God's will that that country got invaded, or God's will that that storm wiped out that whole village or something, no. That's a projection of God's will onto the world again, as if God is like watching over it and saying, oh, I like this tribe over here, I don't like them over there, zap! But, oh, you will prosper and live many generations, zap! And then, you know, it, God is not anthropomorphic, God is not playing favorites. You know, oh, I like the, the Jews, but I don't like the Arabs, or, you know, it's just ridiculous to think of oneness and love, picking and choosing between the people and the things of this earth. It's, that's not unconditional agape love, that would be a very special uh, preferential treatment and love. So, in terms of the all real pleasure comes from doing God's will, you actually find that you have a calling, like Mother Teresa, Saint Francis, all the saints and mystics, uh, yeah, you could say with the shamans, they have a calling, and when they fulfill the destiny of that calling, there is, there is a lasting sense of joy, but the joy is coming from the, the listen follow, from following the guidance, and the joy is coming from the alignment with Source, and it's not really coming from the forms and the things of the world. They can be reflections of that joy, certainly, but, but they are not the source or the cause of that joy. And so, it's so beautiful in the sense that when you give yourself over, there's, there's a lightness of being, there's an expansiveness, um, but it's also a sense of being sourced. So there isn't any sense of um, personal responsibility with it, there isn't any kind of sense of, uh, of a weightiness, or, oh, I've got to carry this load, or anything. There's no sense of sacrifice with it, it's, mm -hmm. it's just very light, very joyful, and very freely given. And you also find that that joy is, is distinguishable from what seems to be the little flits of, of pleasure that come from 
some kind of self-concept achievement, you know, attaining something in the world or building a new skill or or accomplishing something or achieving something, which are these little blips on the radar screen where the ego is happy that uh, you've attained or you've accomplished something new. That it, it kind of, if it had a face, it would nod in, in agreement. Like, very good. But Jesus tells us the one thing you have learned from all of these uh, ego accomplishments and so forth, that when you have achieved them, they have not satisfied you. You can always tell by the dissatisfaction that's associated, even with little judged successes or little judged pleasures, there's always a discontent or a feeling, is that all there is, or there has to be more. Mm. There's a dissatisfaction, an undercurrent of dissatisfaction. And that's how you can start to notice self-concept things, where when you have achieved them, they have not satisfied you. In fact, I often go back to the Bible, but I remember that, that story with Jesus and the woman at the well, when Jesus is there and, and uh, the woman comes to him and she sees just a Jewish man and, uh, and then whatever's coming out of Jesus' mouth, he, he's telling her all about what's going on in her life and, and almost like reading her mind at the well. And uh, that's the one where she goes running off because she thinks she's encountered some kind of a prophet or, or something. Because she runs back and says, you know, he he know he he told everything about me, and uh, and Jesus actually said, uh, um, call your husband. Uh, but she didn't have a husband. She had many men, <laughs> so she was a little freaked out by just call your husband because he was like he knew every thought. In her. But at the, in the end, she does bring him the water to have a drink, and then Jesus throws one more beautiful line, uh, Drink of me, and you will never thirst again. That's the Divine Spirit, the Holy Spirit, saying, Drink of me. It's for everybody. It wasn't just for the woman at the well, it was for the whole universe. It was for everyone. Drink of me, and you will never thirst again. Drink of me and you will know your true self. You will know true contentment, true fulfillment. You will not know lack. You will not know need. You will not know want. You will know in the fullness that you are the meaning that the whole world is searching for. Who you are is the, is the answer to the riddle. Who you are is the purpose of this world. When I first read that in the Course, you know, I was, I was whoa. You are the goal the world is searching for. Never heard that from mom and dad. You know, just it did not come out. You imagine that? You really could soar if you heard that in a teenager. I had a rough day, and think, you are the, the goal the world is searching for. Okay, I'm important. I, I'll keep at it, then I must be really important if I'm the goal the world is searching for. That's the way the spirit sees it. Who you are, not a personality self, but your spiritual self is the goal the world is searching for. Not for the bigger, better, faster, more. Not for what can I accumulate, what can I possess, how can I leave my legacy for future generations, and on and on and on. It's self-realization is everything. It's, it, it literally is everything. So, when we talk about this attraction to guilt, it doesn't help analyzing it, it doesn't even help uh, just to know the concept, but it, it's, it starts to point you in the right direction. That That's why it's so important to give your mind over to miracles. That actually that is the purpose. That is our vocation, is to be miracle workers. That is the purpose of A Course in Miracles, it's training miracle workers. And I have to say, it's really good training, even though at the beginning, I'm sure, I had the same reactions that most everybody would have, like, miracle worker, are you told? Who are you talking, me? Did you, what, what do you mean? I mean, th there was no training in my Bible school. We were not trained in Bible school to go out and be miracle workers. You know, that, that would probably have been seen as arrogant, like, 
who do you think you are to think, you know, let Jesus did the miracles 2,000 years ago, but you know, you're just a human being and you know, you got to survive and make the best of it like the rest of the humans. But this is a course in miracles and it's actually training the mind to be very consistently miracle minded, to be on the ready, to be open. And I'm not talking about parting the Red Sea and turning water into wine and so forth. There, there will be some reflections that are very out of pattern that come along on this journey. So you're not to be shocked and surprised when these kind of experiences happen. You shouldn't, you know, be like Bruce Almighty, you know, when the, he parts the, remember the, the bowl of tomato soup, tomato soup and he <laughs> parts the, and he, oh, you know, he has a moment in the restaurant where, you know, you're not to get uh, so distracted by parting the tomato soup or, or anything that happens, but those kind of things can happen. There are supernatural or out of pattern experiences, but it's more like just take it in stride because there's a much greater goal, mm -hmm. which is knowing who you are. Don't get distracted by psychic abilities, don't get distracted by any kind of seemingly Manifestation. ma manifestations, powers, personal powers, telepathic powers, anything. Uh, <clears throat> even with those, it's like don't get shocked by them, but just remember, oh yeah, this is a part of a, of a greater context of me waking up to know who I am, and, and I shouldn't put any kind of personal investment in these things, and think that I'm better than anybody else, because I'm just learning how to truly communicate. And communication is natural as, as a child of God. Mm -hmm. Full communication is, is very natural. No private thoughts, no people pleasing is very natural to, to a child of God. And so, I would say also that, that as you're drawn in towards the light, then in the parable of David, what seemed to happen was I was drawn more and more to making myself ever more available to be used in a larger plan of helpfulness, is a way of saying it. And what that also meant was I became less and less drawn to personal goals or personal achievements or anything that the world could offer. Because the, the joy of being in my function was was like the tractor beam. That was actually what was drawing me. I wasn't trying to figure out the error. I wasn't trying even try to, to come up with something to overcome the error. I was simply letting myself be drawn toward what I, I could be truly helpful in. Mm -hmm. And I did memorize that prayer at the beginning of, uh, of the course. Uh, I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent Him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or do, for He who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever He wishes, knowing He goes there with me. And I will be healed as I let Him teach me to heal. So I took that to heart. I memorized it and I even would practice in the early years, whenever I would come to a doorway, doesn't matter whether I was going to visit my grandmother, to the grocery store, to the bathroom, <laughs> to a house, walking to a course meeting, I would pause quietly before I would go through every single doorway in my life. And I would pause and I would use that quiet prayer internally only in my mind to set my function. So I would walk in there with the purpose of being used as an agent of healing. Not to walk through those doorways to get something, not not looking to receive something in a worldly way. Uh, for example, the grocery store. You go to the groceries, you think, well, I'm going there to buy the groceries. Jesus is like, yeah, well, don't worry, the groceries will get bought, but you're not here for the groceries. You're here to extend healing. Okay, well, alright, I could buy that, okay, but how does that... Try it, try it. Let me be the guide. You just say your prayer at, the, at those automatic <laughs> doors, before you go through those automatic electric doors, you just say your prayer, and then I'll, I'll take over uh, from there, and we'll be using it as a practice. And what happened was then, as I was going through, I was smiling, 
at everybody, smiling at customers in the aisles. I've said of me reading all the ingredients like I had done in the past, what, comparing the prices. You know, it's quite a ritual to go shopping. You know, we've all got our little shopping rituals and you get in there and get the job done. Another thing was time for me. Get in, be efficient, get what you need and get out. <laughs> so there was a pretty strong time pressure on the whole shopping experience. Lots of preferences. Uh, instead of going through there, what would you have me shop for today? Uh, I went in there with either a written or a mental list and the time pressure, get in and get out. Mm -hmm. And then when I would get to the checkout line, um, pretty much I wasn't smiling or talking to people at all when I was shopping. I was basically getting around there, being efficient, getting the card filled up and then doing the game at the checkout, which is the shortest line. Oh, which, which line is moving the fast? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. Jesus is like, oh my God, what an agenda. <laughs> what an agenda you've got. You're here to forgive and you are trying to play master shopper uh, instead of mastering your mind, mastering the ego. You're trying to play master shopper instead. And then the more you do it, you start to realize, wow, I've got a, a pretty good agenda for a lot of things. It's not just the grocery store. I've got agendas for this event, that event, and no wonder I am maintaining this self-concept because I have so many different goals and they vary with situations, but it's always for some kind of personal attainment, achievement, recognition, personal salvation, personal something, and the personal is the core of the problem. The belief that I'm not spirit, that I've taken on a personal identity. So for me, it became very, very practical and not only for myself, but I, I would read books that Jesus would guide me to and, and start to get lots and lots of witnesses that as long as I step back and I let Spirit lead the way, then it was a very flowing, happy, joyful experience. And to the extent that I was coming from a personal self-concept with an agenda to try to accomplish something in the world, it always had its problems. It was always difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's why fame is, has its difficulties, fortune has its difficulties, um, hedonism, living a life just seeking for to maximize pleasure, it has its difficulties. Even becoming an intellectual, you know, it's, it, I have not really met many happy intellectuals. Even the scribe of the Course, who was an exquisite intellectual, she had a brilliant intellectual mind, but she had enormous difficulty with this Course that she was scribing. So the ego was kicking and fighting and screaming all the way until the day she seemed to die. It just, it just was, she accomplished um, what she was given to do, her assignment, for the good of everyone, but also the ego was quite stirred up riled up about uh, this book. It was like, oh no, this is like taking your whiskey straight instead of on the rocks. You know, there was no diluting this. This was coming straight, straight at the ego and really as the answer to the ego, showing the, the nothingness of the ego. And the ego is so arrogant that it just it reacts to that, um, to the light. The ego does believe there's something above it but it doesn't know what that something is. And it's absolutely terrified of whatever that something is that it's above it. But it has an awareness that there's something above it. It's almost like, um, it's like, it's aware that, that, uh, that it's plugged into something and that there's a threat that it, that could get unplugged. Mm -hmm. The parasite's great threat <laughs> is losing its hosts. And it's almost like the ego is living in the darkness, but it's aware that there's like a light switch above it, and that switch can be turned on. And when that switch goes on, the light and the dark don't battle. The, the light is real, and the darkness is no more. Perfect love cast out fear is what the Bible said. So, this is kind of a context for what we're talking about, is starting to just watch these processes as they go on in your mind. Watch these 
these thoughts that are arising, but this is all giving it towards a context for your experiences this weekend. So whatever the experiences are, you can be in a place of, of peace and safety, and you can be in a place of, okay, this is for my good. Whatever was kept hidden, uh, may it be brought to the light. Mm -hmm. Wherever there was dark, chained prison rooms, the, let, the, let the chains be broken. Let the captives free. Let, let the captives come into the light and, and let my mind be free. That's really the prayer of this, and that you need not be afraid of this process of healing. That this is actually what you're praying for, you're actually calling to be healed. And then the darkness arising is just a step in that healing process. It's not something uh, that you need to judge or figure out, or especially don't try to draw a conclusion when dark thoughts are, are coming up for healing. Don't draw any conclusions about that. The ego wants you to draw a dark conclusion, mm -hmm. and that is something's wrong. something's wrong, and that's a conclusion you're drawing about your identity, and it's mm -hmm. quite happy for you to rest and draw those conclusions. Now, I'm going to go into some real deep stuff now. This is the, this is the preliminary, <laughs> before we get into Q&A. Get comfortable. Uh, this, there's a, a beautiful line. When we think about bodies, we th think about things that seem to have a mind of their own, and they have actions and reactions. They seem to have their own thoughts. They seem to be quite autonomous. It's kind of like the, the story of Pinocchio. Remember the, the puppet, the, the marionette, who then uh, wants to have a life of its own. He, he wants to be more than Geppetto's puppet. He wants to have a life of his own. In fact, he, if we use the marionette analogy, it's like the puppet wants to be off the strings. No strings attached. Like with your wireless devices, you know, will you ever go back to cords? Probably not. Once the devices, once those phones are off the cords, once all the devices, the little listening devices, the whatever, are off the cords, you're like, yeah, this is more convenient than having those cords around. Well, those strings that pull the puppet, uh, basically, Pinocchio wants to be an autonomous, real boy. That's the whole parable. And then he gets that wish to be a real boy takes him off into Pleasure Island, which ties into the beginning of this talk, and then it has disastrous consequences, you know, where half, was it half donkeys and half a little boy, and I mean, it, it gets wilder and wilder as you go on in this, but he's got Jiminy Cricket, it's like the voice of the Holy Spirit, and he just doesn't listen to Jiminy Cricket. Uh, that's like the Holy Spirit, like saying, you know, no, this is a distraction, and that's the same thing the Holy Spirit is saying, don't get caught up in Pleasure Island, because you're not, you're going to be split in ways that you can't even imagine. You're not even going to feel like a whole human being anymore if you go down these roads, because they're tricks. So, here's the, here's the depth. The mind is causative. And the mind creates like God. It's capable of creation. It's like God's mind is capable of creation. That's what the meaning of co-create. You're co-creator with God. You have creative ability. God gave you creative ability, but it's just in spirit. You don't co-create in this world. That's a, that's a level confusion. You co-create in heaven. You have, you have a creative extensions that come through you and are of you. You have, you have children, but they're not flesh children. They're spiritual beings, or you might say they're extensions, and that's all coming at the level of pure spirit. And then the mind, when it falls asleep, it believes it has the power to make, or invent, or manifest, instead of create. It was given creative ability, but now it's distorted into what we call miscreation, which is to make, or, or invent. And what happens is, 
part of this belief that you can make something unlike God is the belief of bestowing those inventions with qualities and characteristics and things that aren't real. So you can make up humans and you can bestow them with artificial thoughts, but they aren't real thoughts. They're like, they're like fake creatures with fake minds and fake thoughts, and it's all fake news. To borrow the phrase, you know, it's a giant cosmic fake news operation. And, and then Jesus is coming in with the Course and he's saying, well, I'm going to tell you really how to find that peace of mind. And here's the line. He says, it's an amazing line, don't raise body thoughts to the level of mind. Fascinating. What does he mean by that? Do not raise body thoughts to the level of mind. He's basically saying, if you attempt to raise body thoughts to the level of mind, you will experience guilt. Why? Because you're not giving control of these body thoughts to me, to use for your awakening. You see, we're fine with fake. Okay, you got some body thoughts going on there. <laughs> okay, Jesus is like, no problem. Okay. Relax, forget about it. Give it to me. You just give me those body thoughts and I know exactly what to do with it. I'll smile with those body thoughts. I'll laugh with those body thoughts. I'll show kindness. Uh, you'll get a really good case of Mother Teresa-itis if you <laughs> give me those body thoughts because I know how to use those body thoughts, which aren't real, by the way, but I know how to use them to unwind you from your belief that they're real. Mm. Now, where is the guilt coming in here, Jesus? Where is the guilt coming in? Well, when you raise body thoughts to the level of mind, you take them away from my control, Jesus' control, for the plan of awakening, and you hold a personal responsibility to those thoughts. You feel guilty because you feel personally responsible, which the ego made them up. Remember, the Holy Spirit can use whatever the ego made, but instead of giving them over and saying, here, you use them for the greater plan, you claim responsibility, accountability for these unreal thoughts that aren't, aren't from God, and then that's where the guilt comes in because of the wrongness feeling. Can you give me an example of body thoughts? Well, let's say it relates to thoughts around certain foods. We, we talked about the, the Australian licorice, but the Australian licorice thoughts are body thoughts. I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we could say sexual attraction thoughts. We could say Look at the range, you just go down to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, you know, his pyramid, and you can find at the bottom, you can find a lot of needs, wants, that are part of the human condition. It could be thoughts around climate, it could be thoughts around temperature, it could be thoughts around um, the way the body looks, or body image thoughts. Uh, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I wish I had thin elbows or whatever, it can, you know, whatever those, there's a huge variation. We talked about the pedophile thoughts Robert was bringing up. We, we could talk about the huge range of body thoughts in all their shapes and sizes and forms and, and wants and likes and preferences and so on and so forth. You know, there's a huge amount of, of body thoughts. And even, let's say, you're you're uh, out at night one time on a clear night and you're looking up and you're gazing at the stars and you find this one star that's quite bright and then you start thinking, wow, I wonder how many light years away <laughs> that star is. That's a body thought. Light years away from what? The body. <laughs> you see? Or you can start to see have, oh, the, but the scientists are telling me that ball of gas has burned out and I'm just watching, I'm getting, the, the light is just receiving me from so far away and I'm just seeing this star now even though it's, they're telling me it's gone, <laughs> it's already burned out. 
me. Who's the me that's perceiving the star and thinking all these thoughts about how far away is the star? That's all self-concept thoughts. They're all body thoughts. So uh, this would relate to actions like, for example, when we're talking about the pedophile thoughts, but you could take any kind of distorted body thoughts that, you know, the ego basically is very uncomfortable with body thoughts, even though it made them, it's, it can get quite uncomfortable. There's only so many orifices and holes and pores and things, and there are certain <laughs> fluids that are supposed to go into certain orifices and holes and certain things that can go in and certain things that can not go in. Whether you're talking about a top orifice or a bottom orifice or whatever, there's a lot there. Some are called appropriate uh, impulses and some are called inappropriate. You see how the ego is pretty good. It, it even break, breaks apart the appropriate things for bodies and the inappropriate things. There have been people burned at the stake for some of the things that were spoken about or said or actions that were done. People labeled as witches and label vicious, vicious, vicious. But what we have to start to realize is that all of these things, whether they're judged to be positive or negative, whether they're judged to be appropriate or inappropriate, like the pedophile thoughts, they're in the inappropriate category, it could be, they're all part of the same thing and they're all part of the problem because the ego has invented them all. So you get all caught up into the rights and wrongs and the goods and the bads and, and always judging which, which is right. And, and Jesus says, everyone who comes to this place and makes a self-concept is always judging the good and the bad and trying to hope that it has more good to outweigh the bad. What a dark system. <laughs> what a dark system. You see how religion can be used, misused to play on that. Here's the good things, you go to heaven. Here's the bad things, you go to hell. It's up to you, but, you know, before I came, I was reading in the, on the news about uh, the Mormons had come out and said that you, you cannot, you're not supposed to drink coffee or any coffee product. You can't have any coffee product. In fact, don't go in a coffee shop. <laughs> don't go there. I thought, I was telling Slava, I said, well, here's some of the extremes now on the other side, where it's like, there's all these things about what's good for you, spiritually even, and, and judging coffee and coffee products to be on the not good. And then other places, you know, you know, could be the flip side. So, here's the key. Do not raise body thoughts to the level of mind. If you hold on to these thoughts and you give them reality, you're going to be caught into the, the this catch-22. Is it good or bad? Is it right or wrong? And there's always uncertainty about those thoughts. And then there's going to be guilt by attempting to raise body thoughts to the level of mind, because you're attempting, when you raise them up to the level of mind, you're attempting to give them causation. But just remember, God didn't create these thoughts. How can, how can you really raise body thoughts to the level of mind, if you reach the level of mind, you realize, God creates love. God is love. God is not, God did not create the body. God did not create linear time. God did not create anything of the cosmos. But as soon as I take that on and I say, oh, it's real. You see how that's usurping the creator of, of reality and saying, no, I know better God and I'm concerned about this orifice and what happened to it and what inside, went in and what went out and oh, I've got the evidence now and I, heard, I don't know if it's a rumor or not, but I even heard that. You know, it's it's going to go churning into more guilt because it's still trying to usurp the Creator by giving reality to something that doesn't have reality. Now this, I've never given a talk quite like that, but this also gives more credence and more belief to the importance of mind training and to the importance of expression sessions and altar sessions. Because 
initially that's what wasn't that what we set up for the altar session was whatever thoughts you've got going on that are churning in your mind you feel guilt shame fear doubt with put them on the altar in a sense that's saying you're just giving them up back over to Jesus back over to spirit the Holy Spirit here take this from me you know what to do with it and you see how that brings us back to guidance too it's not saying that you're not going to have these thoughts, but it's saying that if you give them over, then the Holy Spirit will use everything for your awakening. Are sexual thoughts <laughs> right or wrong? Are sexual attraction thoughts right or wrong? Well, you're asking, it depends on the purpose for which they're used. Are you going to give them over to the plan, the higher plan, and that knows exactly where your mind is, exactly what you can handle, exactly what will be helpful for you. And if you give them over, then you can trust that your guidance will come and will reflect that higher power, that, that wisdom. And, and now we're getting down into the real details because it's just your willingness to not raise body thoughts to the level of mind, but instead to hand them over, whatever they are, it doesn't really matter. There's The Holy Spirit's not going, oh, wow, that's a shameful one. I, how long have you kept that hidden? How many years? You know, the Holy Spirit does not think like that. The Holy Spirit's like, oh. I mean, I remember in the Bible one time, some of the stuff in the Bible, I just was like, oh, I was so turned off by. I just was like, oh. One of the things in the Bible was, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I was just like, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I just, and then I get to the Course and Jesus says, ah, that is simply reinterpreted. Uh, those thoughts of, of vengeance do not belong in your holy mind. Give them to me. I was like, oh my God. If you can reinterpret vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, into a positive affirmation, you are the Lord of life. <laughs> I will follow you. Because the initial reaction was, oh, the terrible thing. And then Jesus, oh, here's the reinterpretation. In fact, I had a, over in Kentucky, I, uh, I had a little retreat center years ago, uh, it was a little double wide, we called it a retreat center, it's five acres and we, we were so happy to have a place to do retreats, but we, we went there and to get to it you had to go down this road and there was a barn there and uh, this was painted with these big letters, all thieves must die. <laughs> I mean, every time I take a group of people in a spiritual <laughs> retreat, I care, you come, okay, you see a few run-down, burn-out cars, but it's not like a barn with all thieves must die. So I would take a whole car load by, and two, inevitably two or three people would get back, and then we get to the gathering and they go, and by the way, what is the meaning of that sign that we saw down the road? All thieves must die. And I said, well, you know, the Bible says, the wages of sin uh, is or death. The wages of sin is death, and sin is is the belief in lack. And what is thievery but the belief you can steal something from another, even though thou shalt not steal and everything. So I would I would tie the idea of thief in with death, and I would say, well, that's just stating a fact. All thieves must die, and they'd be like. What? what do, wait a minute, what did you say? And I'd say, well, thievery is a, is a mistake, it's an error, death is an error, and thievery and death, stealing and death are the same, same idea, except it seems to take different forms. But they're really the same. And that's why the Ten Commandments, which were mostly about behavioral things, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, that was what those commandments were kind of guidelines. In behavior, but actually the other parts of the Ten Commandments, like thou, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Now that's getting more into a mental coveting, wishing, wanting, lusting for. You see, it's, it's not so much a behavioral, it's, it's getting down into the mind. And that's really where the Course is going. It's going to raise up all those 
false desires, all those covets, all those wishes and wants things to be a certain way, give them over to the Spirit and be free of them forever. Robert, you had your hand up. described it, it seems like everything I ever do is body thoughts. I mean, you know, I come here to the ceremony where it's here, so this is for my body. I do this, I do that. Yeah. You know, and I mean, it, it, so I guess I would be raising those thoughts to the level of the mind, but but what does it actually mean? What is, how do I give that just all over the spirit? So everything I do is just giving it to the spirit. Well, I, for me, the way I, I found to go at that practically was, I remember getting, I think it was through the course workbook, and what would you have me say, where would you have me go? Uh, it was like this sense of, of if, if I believe in a me, a mini-me, we'll call it, <laughs> if I believe in a mini-me, and you can use the mini-me to help me undo my belief in the mini-me, then, uh, sounds like Austin Powers, but Austin Powers, Pathway to God. Then, basically, it, it was just, or it was back to that thing of guidance, like, I wasn't, I wasn't really trying to compartmentalize or break it apart, or analyze it in any way, but I was, there was a, a turning over moment early on with my work with the Course, where I just said to Jesus, okay, I, I, I feel you, I know, I want you to guide my life, here's my, my possessions, here's my skills and abilities, here's my worldly learning, you know, I just kind of did an upload of, I kind of did an inventory of what I perceived myself to be in this world, then I kind of did this piece by piece, I give it to you, I give it to you. And of course that came back, you know, because when I'm out on five years of walkabout with Jesus, you know, at times I had to have these money talks, like, uh, I need money, and he's like, I'm providing everything for you. Why do you need money? <laughs> and, or, you know, oh, I don't like, I don't like this culture, I don't like this culture at all. Well, it's in you. You may not like it, but that culture's in you. I don't like this society, that society's in you. You know, whatever I would say that I didn't like, Jesus would be saying, it's in your mind. We're working on it, but you know, you, you don't have to keep thinking that the, the enemy is external. Uh, because it's the ego, and that's a belief in the mind, and we need to expose that. But I think it did start, like that prayer at the beginning of the book, back in the first edition, it was on 24, I am here only to be truly helpful. I went into that kind of, I give it over, you lead the way, you show me how to heal. I don't care. I don't have to worry about what to say or do. I don't, I'm content to be wherever, you know, you see how that starts to wash away those thoughts of, yeah. I'd rather be here than there, or I'd rather be doing this than that. So, in one sense, it was like Jesus saying, of course you have lots of body thoughts, but that's no problem, that won't hinder us in the least bit, as long as you put them under my control and my direction, he was saying. And that was a relief. You know, just imagine, you can do that right now. You can just say, well, here's how the, how they look right now, or what's going through my mind, but, but I really am going to give them over, and I want you to use, use it all. Use the ego's preferences, use the ego's likes and dislikes. Use it all to, to loosen me from the belief in any of it, so that I can be free of all of it. And, to me, that's like a, a, a real kind of a handing over. Sometimes Christians will say, you know, put your life in, in, the, in the hands of God or entrust uh, your life into, into doing God's work. Or, you know, people have different ways of saying it. But for me, it was a real heartfelt prayer. And it also was accompanied by, wow, I've tried it on my own, but this is not succeeding. I have tried. That's a, that's a Peter Cetera share song. I tried it on my own, but deep inside I've known we'd be back to set things straight. <laughs> it's like, and this is what we're, we're coming back to set things straight. 
in a very humble way, I'm asking for a reset. I'm asking for a reset here. And to me, that works. That, that is actually effective. You don't have to think about it as Robert handling it, but just more a prayer coming up from within you. Use me, use, use it all in a way that will, that will free my mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's again where the guidance is so helpful because originally the, your first question there was, okay, how do I turn these thoughts over? And what I would, when I would ask Jesus about how do I do this, he would always say, well, Holy Spirit is the how. But he would give me tips. He would say, well, the only thing preventing you from handing them over to the Holy Spirit is you still value them. So that you're still wanting to hide them from the Holy Spirit and you're still wanting to protect them from the Holy Spirit. And that helped too. Because when I first was in the Course, I, I read, at some point in the Course I read that I was afraid of love. And so I, my reaction to that was, I, I don't get that at all. I want love. I love love. I want, I want, I'm trying to experience love and you're telling me I'm afraid of love. I don't get it at all. And Jesus said, well, you're, you're defending against love. And I said, that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I don't get it. Why am I defending against love? That seems irrational. That seems insane. He said, okay, we'll try it from another angle. You're defending against love. What are you defending for? I said, what do you mean defending for? What are you protecting? If you're defending against love, which you don't believe, let's look at another angle. What are you defending for? What do you still value? What do you protect that, that keeps you from knowing the experience of divine love? I said, well, I guess there's a lot of things. And he said, yes there are. Let's look at those. The, that's where we start getting into the self-concept. Whenever you feel the need to become defensive about anything, you have identified yourself with an illusion. What is this illusion? It's a self-image. It's a self-concept that God did not create. You're protecting an image that the ego made up, and you value that image more than divine love. That's why you're afraid of love because you're protecting the unreal. So, in answer to your question, how do I give these truly to the Holy Spirit? It comes to a real sincere honesty like, hmm, the real question is, what am I still protecting? And why am I protecting it? I started to go at it more from that angle. And as soon as I started to come at it from that angle, then every day Jesus was saying, Something would happen, I'd have a reaction, I'd feel constricted, defensive or whatever. Jesus would say, ah, you believe in something that you value there more than truth. What was that you just noticed? Hmm. Well, I, I thought the driver was going too slow in front of me. Oh, too slow. Okay. Time. You've got a real time concept going there, you know. If it's all just under my control and it's perfectly orchestrated for the good of the whole, why are you concerned about slow and fast? At one point I was, you know, after 10 years of university I was trying to be efficient and Jesus is like, who, who said efficient according to whose standards, you know? What's your, what's your definition of efficient? And I said, timely. He said, there you go again, time. Uh, well, Things have to get done. Oh, do they? Oh, do they? Are they under my control or your control? And then, well, I don't, I, sometimes I have to rush. Jesus at one point said, no, you never, ever, ever in your life, again, have to rush. Ever. And to the extent that we give it over to Jesus, to the Spirit, that, that is the end of rush. You never find yourself 
needing to rush because you feel like it's all part of an orchestration, it's all getting handled. There's nobody judging slow or fast in our mind. That's just the ego trying to throw more guilt. So that's another duality, slow and fast. Not fast enough, not slow enough, not gentle enough, too harsh. You know, you can see the ego is just, these are all body thoughts, like yeah. trying to tell the universe, you know, like, no, you got it wrong, yeah. and I've got a fantasy world here, and I want my fantasy world to be right, and I would rather be right about the fantasy world than to be happy about the Kingdom of Heaven. That's ultimately what's happening every time there's an upset. It is the state of mind. It's, it's it's what everything is bringing us to. Is that state of mind of happiness that the ego is, you know, as we're, while we're identified with that frantic idea and thinking that that's us, we're of course trying to fill it up with something that will make it feel safe. So our whole life we've spent trying to build something, some kind of kingdom around ourselves to feel safe, and it never ever really works. It's always threatened. And so it's so beautiful. It's like the, the miracle is the shift from fear to love. So all this stuff that we try so desperately to fill ourselves up with, externally, people, jobs, whatever, comfortable living situation, that's the distraction, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a total distraction. And when you finally just start to lean back and say, I will, I will step back and let you lead the way. I don't even know what that means. But you start to explore it. And then the convincing, like you always talk about, the convincing of the spirit starts. And, and little by little, you build this trust in this unseen power of love that, that has you. Because this is very unnatural to actually effort your life. It's actually an unnatural state of being. It's a stressful state of being. And so this beautiful Course in Miracles comes in and just shows us how to undo that stress and worry. And then the medicine that we'll be partaking in, it starts to show you, you know, like you can get, you can get caught in your thoughts because you're trying to protect, for myself anyway, in my experience, I'm trying to protect some type of, type of identification with being a person. And as I let go, then I'm able to be opened up to the truth of who I am. But while I'm hanging on to that construct, and you know, and you mentioned the fear of love, you know, who would ever think that we're afraid of love? You know, but I, 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 I've seen it. I've seen this deep fear of this light that, that dissolves the self-concept. It's like, you know, in Bufo, that's what I really experienced, like with the, the last thought that I thought it was like this, almost like if I stay holding on to this thought, then I'm going to loop in absolute terror. And as soon as I let go of it, it's just like complete heaven. So it's just hanging on to these ideas that we think are going to bring us happiness, you know. It's the tiny mad idea, just completely, you know, running around frantically, like this will make me happy, that will make me happy, this will make me happy. And so that's why for a long time I just would have this one simple reminder, does this support my awakening or doesn't it? And then I had to get very precise with it, like, or is it a distraction, you know? And so there's innocence underneath it. It's like, it's just that, it's just kind of an ignorance of, we don't know who we are. We didn't come in with an owner's manual. Nobody explained it to us. It's like, but now we have this almost like handbook out of hell with the Course of Miracles. I mean, honestly, for those of you that aren't fam that familiar with it, it gives you step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step instructions on how to actually uh, unplug from this fearful thought, this tiny mad idea that we've actually separated from our source. So it's just very beautiful. You know, that it's like this, this frantic idea, and underneath it, it's just seeking for love but can never find it. It's like looking for love in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Oh, I was just stressing. Just, just stressing. <laughs> <laughs> Body thought. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah.
and be very gentle with the unwinding from these body thoughts. Like even, I don't know, you can maybe share a little bit about like Helen Shecklin with the, was it green pantyhose mm -hmm. and a certain coat that she liked and, you know, Jesus just really, let's say, we call it whims, like the whims will come in as, as you practice and you devote your mind more and more to the truth, then even the things that that are whims for you and that you would like to have, they do show up. I mean, when I came into community, I absolutely thought I was going to be in a sacrificial situation. Like I was going to sacrifice nice restaurants, by going to a hotel, whatever, whatever it is, vacations. Mm -hmm. But no, it, it, I remember being with you in, in Canada, that one of those first retreats with that thought in my mind, and there we were in this beautiful harbor, in, I don't know where we were, Vancouver or something, uh, and there was the, you know, David was teaching, we had a whole group there, and I was looking at these beautiful windows at this harbor, and I was like, wow, this is where I'd want to go on vacation, <laughs> but it's even better, because I'm here listening about the undoing of the mind, which is that was a passion as well, so it's like... Yeah. So it's this constant convincing that starts to happen. But you don't you don't set it up. It will be set up for you. Because it wants to show, you know, the truth of who we are. It's just waiting. It's almost like, just turn towards me. I'll take you. Yeah, it's a good kind of example. You know how the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added unto you. All those whims and things that you think, Wow, that would be nice, that would be nice they can be added unto you as part of the guidance, as part of listening and following and doing this for the whole universe. Like with Helen Schuckman, she liked green pantyhose, she liked a certain kind of organa winter coat. She was in New York City and, uh, and also she, had, she would only pay a certain price, she wanted it used. And basically Jesus for, as a time-saving device to get back to the dictations, <laughs> said, I will tell you exactly where to go in New York City to get your green pantyhose and your organic coat paying only this price, you know. Now that's a form of manifesting, you could say. You're working with your mind and, and Jesus, instead of like uh, Sai Baba materializing the green pantyhose and the, the organic coat in her, in her closet, that probably would have freaked Helen. She's a research psychologist and she might have cut off the transmission. Cease transmission! <laughs> if my husband finds out I'm manifesting green pantyhose and coats in my closet, I'll never hear the end. Oy vey, never hear the end of that one. So, you see how it has to come in a way, in that sense it was a time-saving way, but it's the same for all of us. If you, I have found the same I know Svava, we have so many things, over so many years things just come in. I was traveling uh, one time I think in California doing a whole series of, uh, of gatherings with Armel, mm -hmm. and Armel didn't even tell me, but she loves uh, salmon. And we went to like four or five different places, they didn't even communicate with us, mm -hmm. just served us up salmon dinner, mm -hmm. salmon dinner, salmon dinner, salmon dinner, salmon dinner, and then she's like, I didn't want to say it, but I really was hankering for some salmon. <laughs> and uh, oh, we're traveling with Kirsten, you know, she was born on an island, seemingly, and she loved to be around water, and then there was water, 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 water. Ice cream, she loved ice cream, yeah. ice cream, ice cream, we're in Wisconsin, she was having a real funky day, she was really disturbed, and really upset, and so, Jesus just told me, just take her hand and walk her over to Dairy Queen. She's never been to a Dairy Queen in her life. So she's like really having a bad day. Took her hand, we walk across the street, we go into Dairy Queen, and there's nobody in there. Just this guy with this little red hat, all puffed up. Oh, welcome to Dairy Queen! <laughs> he's so happy to be working at Dairy Queen, he's just so happy to be of service, and he's got one person in front of him. Kirsten, who's never been. So I walk up <laughs> behind her and I said, I looked him in the eye, he said, how can I help you? He said, she's from New Zealand, she's never been in a Dairy Queen in her whole life. <gasps> I said, show her what you got. <laughs> well, we got breezes and we got 
You know, he was like, set him off for five minutes. He was so excited. And then I think she maybe got like a blizzard with, I don't know, Reese's and, you know, she got <laughs> pick what, you know, have it your way, you know. And then she's like, and then when we left there, guess who was happy? Kirsten. She was thrilled. She was, she was out of her funky day. But see, that's, the, that's when you give those body thoughts. You don't, Jesus is not saying, okay, sit her down, have a counseling session with her. <laughs> Jesus knows what's going to work. Dairy Queen <laughs> is going to work without a doubt. And he uses those body thoughts to bring about a sense of lightness and happiness. And the spirit always knows what's best. It's like the human mind, the, the mind is asleep. It's the problem. How is it supposed to know what's best in any situation when it's made up situations? It's made up the situational thinking. It's, it's like one quantum experience and the mind has, the ego has broken it to all these separate uh, situations and then it's got meanings that it's given to all the different people and all the different situations and you can't see the tapestry, you can't see the whole when you're focused on the part and the agenda of, of having the part be a certain way. So that's the fun part. We have many, many, many parables to just share of, okay, you give your life over and then what happens next? Well, good. We want to, we, we talk about those, those situations, those parables. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are much more helpful than metaphysics mm -hmm. because the mind, that's why Jesus spoke in parables a lot 2,000 years ago because people could relate to them. If he just came and said, the kingdom of heaven is within you, Seek not outside yourself. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And then poof, nobody would, we wouldn't have a Bible, just be, it'd be like, uh, I was hallucinating. I saw some guy today, he said a few things and disappeared. Oh, forget about it, you know, that's impossible. But no, he was what? Reaching the people, talking with the people, living with the people, living with the apostles, living with the, the group of women, there was like a, a women's core of like 70 women that were supporting Jesus that were kind of written out of the Bible, but they were there uh, supporting him everywhere he went. Uh, they were so strong in support, but, but the, that was the living, the experience, actually living it and, sh and demonstrating it in human interactions with, with everyone. That's what we're called to do, is demonstrate it in what seemed to be our lives in form. Isn't that a great calling? I mean, how could you really say no to such a beautiful, inspiring calling? Yeah, you know, what I noticed in the beginning, when I, when I decided, uh, I had heard the Spirit, because I was dabbling in all kinds of different spiritualities, and I heard him say, um, choose one, just choose one, stop this kind of mixing. And, and so the Course in Miracles was pretty steady, so I, I really devoted my mind as best I could uh, to this practice of forgiveness, and it was amazing what started to happen. That, that's it, it, it. Really, it was like all I wanted to do was stay centered on that, and then everything in form just came up around me. Really, like a whole spiritual retreat center was built um, without my effort. I was so focused on just practicing forgiveness that. Everything was given, and that's that what you were talking about, what the Bible says about you know, focus or seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all things will be added unto you. And, and, and the beautiful thing about it, everyone, is it's not about the form, it's about the state of mind, and it's about the feeling of being loved. Like, I always feel like those are symbols of being loved. Like, wow, there is a, a force that loves me, actually. I mean, that's pretty cool to actually come into the experience that all things are working together for good. And even if there is, you know, feelings of suffering or feelings of, of um, conflict or triggers, of course there's going to be. The purification process has to occur. But that's what the practice of forgiveness is, is to see how it's wholly untrue in the end as you, as you transmute it. But if there's, if I, I just focus on forgiveness, I don't even have to think, really, effort, think in an effort way about anything. It just shows the way. And it's just so beautiful. And, and there, we, 
could, we could write books and books on how things work out in, in the form as the mind is focused on the truth. It's just beautiful. Mm-hmm. And that's they a fun work parable. out better than you can imagine. Like oh, you try to plan it and think this and that, oh but my when God comes in, it's miraculous. Oh, it's so much. I mean, Willow, she, she's been having this desire to live in a yurt. Hello. For the last three retreats, we've been in the most amazing, and I mean amazing yurts. In the Yosemite, we had a private lake with a fed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was just like she's her win, you know? It's like a month in yurts. <laughs> Not just any little old yurt. It's like. <coughs> so it's really lovely to share that. <laughs> Forgiveness really works, and, and it is the key, you know, when, like when Jesus says something is the key to happiness, it's worthy of our attention to, like, okay, this is the key to happiness, and then, and then with, since we're all here, and we're, we're it's a ACIM, and the medicine's going to be coming in tomorrow, it's such a beautiful thing, I mean, I, I just feel so, so grateful to have this, uh, a deep inward look with with the fantastic, beautiful clarity of the teachings, and then to start to see that you know the the mind, some of the tricks the mind might want to play, but also just like the relaxation into the moment with the medicine as well, with the teachings. Like maybe you don't understand exactly. It's so high sometimes. It just goes so high the metaphysics, but it's like something just to allow, because you're not going to be able to understand your way through this. Understanding is good to a certain point, but at a certain point, you really have to like turn it over to that part of your mind that actually already knows this, and accept it. It's like accept the correction. Accept the correction. You know, you're not responsible for the error. You're only responsible for the correction. You know, or the acceptance of the correction, mm-hmm. actually. Yeah. It's not even, you're not, you're not even responsible for correction, it's just the acceptance of it. So it's very gentle, really, but the mind just wants to hang on and hang on. So we're just loosening, loosening, loosening as we go along. Yeah. So is there any other, anything else that some, any questions for These the videos, are, you know, you're videotaping this, are they going to be available to us? There's a lot of material. Yeah, it's a lot of material. We'll put it up on YouTube, sure. And if there's any question or anything that you don't want, just let us know. Mm -hmm. You're not being videotaped, but even if it's your voice and you don't want it, we'll Mm -hmm. check it out. Curious in terms of meditation and tuning into spirit and and this voice and and giving into these teachings, what techniques or or commentary you guys have surrounding that, specifically in regards to meditation, you know, and spirit, you know, some of the silence that we're partaking in right now. But it was interesting because I had experienced a number of different uh, types of meditation, but I remember when I was reading the text, I did get to the I need do nothing section in the text. And Jesus mentions meditation in there. He even mentions long periods of meditation in terms of the number of techniques he comes up with. And um, basically he calls them tedious and time consuming. These are like, these are the perennial techniques that for generations have been used in Jesus' commentary. They're tedious and time consuming. They will work because of the goal that they're set for. uh, And it's, but all look forward to future release from the present state of mind, a present condition. You can see where that's where the error is. That's why they're te- he not only tells you they're tedious and time consuming, but he's saying there's such a future emphasis on these. It can involve postures, breathing, it can involve many, many, many techniques. He comes out and says, your way will be different. So now he's going to give a way that's better, that's a time saver better than these tra- very traditional techniques. And he said, a holy relationship is given you as a means for saving time. And then he describes a holy relationship. He says, you and your brother are together. 
he's still using symbols of the world, you and your brother, but he's basically saying, you're one, you're, you are the same one. And, and that ex recognition of that experience is, is so essential, it's, it's absolutely essential, and this is a means that's given you for saving time. So he's saying, here's holy relationship, it's very different from a lot of spiritual pathways that don't necessarily emphasize relationships. It's the more passive renunciation and going off and so on and so forth. But I would say too that that when I opened to the idea about meditation too, that I thought at some point when I was doing the workbook, I thought, wow, this workbook has a lot of rituals. They're very simple, they're very precise, but then I thought, wow, this this entire workbook is a manual for meditation. And I thought, oh my gosh, he's packed it right in the middle of the book. Because I just said, TM, and there's so many different, and I thought, he's put this right in. He's using like traditional, almost like Zen, open-eyed meditations with these most po powerful ideas, and he's saying they can be done in any place, at any time, they don't need special uh, surroundings, you can use these during your everyday activities. So he's designed this kind of master course in meditation uh, that is extremely transferable, extremely ac uh, applicable, ap applicable to all kinds of things. And he's also saying that it's actually a time saver because most of the lessons don't actually require that much time during the day, it just requires application. And, and repetition and, and a real willingness to apply, to transfer the training. Mm -hmm. So, I also looked at some of these and then I would read the lesson and I would say, this is definitely a meditation lesson. You know, he was talking about sinking down mm -hmm. the, the riotous sounds churning in your mind and he was like, these were like, a lot of them are just like guided meditations mm -hmm. that are mixed in there. At one point he he says, today we will use uh, the most, um, the most, I think, difficult or, or the most effective form of meditation. I'm like, okay, what's he going to say now? This is now, he's in the middle of a meditation manual and he's going to say the, the, most, the most important one. Try not to think of anything. <laughs> that, that's it. You know, you, this is the master. He's, you know, the other ones are guided, and there's visualizations, and then, okay, here's a real high one. Try not to think of anything, you know. You can tell that this is a transcendent being, who is a meditation expert, who has given us this Course in Miracles, this uh, workbook. So, so I think that's helpful too, because that's what I did. I was guided to throw myself fully into practicing the Course, taking the Course, uh, he's basically saying, you are not really serving in the optimal way if you are using means that have served others well. Here is my instructions for you. You know, and, and you really feel that coming like, for you. You know, like this is coming to save time. This is a way of, a miracle can save thousands of years of, of learning in terms of the worldly thing. Wow, that's a lot. So, in essence, it's a day-to-day -day application of these lessons in, in terms of transforming your, your typical routines. Yeah, that's it. In fact, when people have asked me the meditation question, because that was my own question initially, I would say, if, if you really just follow the instructions and you give yourself over to that, then that's going to be enormously time-saving mm -hmm. and, and it will be enormously beneficial and it's quite Specific. I don't even. I wouldn't say it's. Uh, it's not strenuous or difficult. I mean, one idea per day. Uh, you know, and then he gives you instructions on that on that idea, how many times to repeat it. Um, so sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the evening. He has periods of meditation where he will say things like, "Our use for words is almost over now." Oh my gosh. You know, he's, he's very specific as you go through these 365 lessons. Words will now mean little to us. 
Ooh, that's exciting. That's that's like a getting into a new phase of the, of the workbook as you get back. That's really exciting. You're tuned in to this listen, follow you know, pathway to awakening, and words will mean little to us now. That's good news, you know, because prayer. I would, people always say, "Can can you reach God through prayers?" And I said, "Not through just uh, word prayers or repetition of Hail Marys and vain repetitions, but but God knows the prayer of the heart before you utter." A single word. So the prayer is the medium for miracles, and prayer is the, I'd say it's like a gateway back. But you have to carefully understand what prayer is. You know, it's not a mechanical repetition of things. Actually, in this, in this Song of Prayer, Jesus dictated a little booklet called Song of Prayer when Helen was struggling around certain things, and uh, Ken Wapnick had said, why don't you just ask Jesus to do some instructions on prayer, and then the whole pamphlet came just on prayer. But prayer is synonymous with desire. So that's good to know too. I remember reading that too in Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures from Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science. I was like, looking, Jesus, Mary Baker Eddy. Oh my gosh, prayer is desire. Thank you. I, I had a whole bunch of other connotations in mind for prayer. Dave, can, can you help me clarify? Um, I have spent most of my life in 12-step programs because of my, in my story there are addictions. And, and they included alcohol and drugs. So that's primarily in our, in our culture, the first thing they do is 12-step programs. Mm -hmm. And, and then, as I, as I graduated the Course in Miracles, um, I, I seem to have one issue that I, I, I get stuck on, because I still go to 12-step programs, because the community is so valuable, and this community is becoming uh, as valuable, if not more. Uh, but in, in the language of the 12 steps, it says, um, we um, became willing to make amends to all people we had harmed, or we something along those lines, I know you're familiar with this, 12 steps. And in, from, from how I read that, we, and in countless stories, you know, people get up on podiums and say, well, I've gone back and I've apologized. I was wrong. I was wrong. But at, at some point, that's just not uh, matching the, the language that Jesus uses from the 12 steps, because it still has this and, and it may just be a stepping stone, but it still has this energy uh, signature of guilt. Of, Separation. Of, well, yeah, of, of saying, you know, of, of the, the, the sin, you know, I'm a sinner and I did this. Now, but it's, it's a very muddy area for many of us who, who have had, um, who are, or, and, and there are many of us who are graduating into the Course in Miracles with this 12-step foundation. Do you have any... any uh, guidance from for those of us who are, are trying to, to wash this, just, just be free of this guilt, which is hindering us, because many of us get stuck in 12-step programs. The 12-step programs can become a circular loop, just like looping thoughts, and, and that's, that's where I found myself. Well, I think what I like about the 12 steps is it, it is divinely guided as a, as a way to um, first address things in the way they seem to be in the world. Like with the, where there seems to be a, like a physical addiction or a physical problem. It doesn't, it doesn't skip over that. It's almost like, uh, you know, like Mother Teresa, where she's like, she's in working in Calcutta and going to all these missions and she basically is feeding and taking in a lot of poor what, what the world would describe as very poor and very sick people. And I see the 12 steps is so good with that. It just meets the mind right where it believes it is, not with a bunch of high ideals or high theologies. It's like there's a lot of care there. And then when you start to get into the things about make amends to those we've harmed, and, and these inventories, I again, I think those are beautifully divinely guided. Because remember, the mind pushed out of awareness God and the light, and also pushed out of awareness that belief in separation and that deep feelings of shame and guilt. And so 
Many people get into such a state of denial, they're so on the surface of consciousness, you know, they use the, the drugs, the alcohol, the, whatever they have, the sex, whatever, to, to basically distract themselves away from the pain. And I think the inventories are actually really good. It's th this is a way, in 12-step terms, of bringing up the private thoughts and bringing up the people-pleasing. Uh, and, and really, it's like saying, I welcome that back to the surface. I want to be aware. I do want to change my mind. And I am looking for healing. And I'm looking for a solution. But it's not bypassing with a bunch of um, affirmations and all is God, all is love, and sweet, 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 and chant, chant, chant. You know, this is a program that is well designed because it knows there's a lot of dark thoughts and beliefs that have to come up. So I always have a great appreciation for that. And even when it says make amends and reach out, you know, isolation, the, when the mind gets in denial, it also gets into extreme isolation. Oh, I, I can handle it all. Oh. Oh, I'm forgiven, I'm saved. I'm saved. You know, that salvation uh, is there, for sure, but it runs really deep. You have to, you have to let go of everything that's blocking that salvation. And the thing I notice a lot about a lot of religions is there's such a focus on rituals and things you're supposed to do or not do on the surface. And a lot of the religions, they simply do not acknowledge or get into the unconscious mind. I mean, even Scientology, which has got quite a bad name for many people, there's a sense of auditing, there's a sense of the unconscious mind. You know, that was acknowledged in there. You gotta love any kind of spirituality. Even the, the work that's being done here is acknowledging there's unconscious beliefs that have got to be exposed and released. And I, to me, that's closer to authentic spirituality. That's closer to going through the darkness to the light. And of course, it's, it's frightening to the ego. So at some point, the ego will try to latch back onto the surface, latch on to rituals maybe that served earlier, but it's like going through the same old motions. That's, that's like, with all spiritualities, there's a tendency to want to go back and cling to the good old days, you know, it's like cling to being a sponsee instead of a sponsor. When, even in the 12 steps, when you have, have been free of something for so many months or so many years or whatever, then it's like, then you're starting to get to the point of being a sponsor. Beautiful. Just like students of the Course eventually shift over to the teacher concept. Because they have to teach what they would learn. And they, they're not aware of their own innocence, divine perfection, so they have to teach it and learn it over and over and over. But I see there's a beautiful progression there. When it talks about an inventory of people we have harmed, you know, it's really one saying, search your mind for your inventory of your attack thoughts. See, that's how you interpret it. You shift it over to A Course in Miracles. It's, it's not that you personally have harmed people, but it's just that there's these thoughts in the mind that didn't come from God, and they do need to be exposed, and they do need to be released. And that's a beautiful thing. In fact, it's Lesson 23 from A Course in Miracles workbook, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. Well, hallelujah! There it is. It's right there in print. The whole key to awakening. <laughs> lesson number 23. You could say, I can escape from the world I see by giving up grievances. Or you could throw another variation. I can escape from the world I see by giving up judgments. Wow! That's what he said, judge not. That's what he said 2,000 years ago. So, it's great that you're here, that you're joining, connecting, because I know, uh, I have another friend, Cindy, who goes to, still to this day, after 20, some years with the Course, she goes hippity hopping around to Course groups, to 12-step groups, like a happy little bee, shining her light, hugging people, laughing with people, demonstrating happiness, demonstrating the correction. And then, of course, there are people that maybe have a question here or there, like in a Course group that have been 12-step, and then she'll say, well, here's my experience, here's, here's what I, I learned to see it this way. I learned to 
have that helpful interpretation come in. That's what we're always praying for, is a helpful interpretation. We're really not here to see differences, we're here to to experience the miracle of, of our love and connectedness. Yeah. So thank you, Kenneth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Yes. Question. First, when I was thinking about coming here, I was all in, and then, of course, I woke up the next day full of doubts. And so I was meditating, and I heard a voice that said, take my hand and come to the mountains. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. Um, but what keeps coming, I think, lesson 138, paragraph 6, it says, solve this one, and all the rest are resolved with it. And I'm, I think I might have answered my question yesterday, why Jesus said solve this decision, because I love figuring things out, solving things. It's like I'm going to get to the bottom of this, no matter what. <laughs> and I think when you're solving, you're not making it unaware, you're trying to figure it out. So I was wondering if you had a comment on that. Yeah. Yeah, the, there's the solving part involves like a two parts where one is is let me recognize the problem so it can be solved. And then the next lesson is let me recognize my problems have been solved. So it's like he presents it in two simultaneous or consecutive, one after the other, workbook lessons. And basically his reasoning is that even if you have the answer, and he says, which you do, it won't help you. The answer won't help you if you've misdefined the problem. It would be like trying to put a like a square peg into a round hole, or vice versa. You know, it's just it's not it's not going to fit because you have to apply the solution or the solving where the problem is. And projection is always the attempt in this world to see the problem as if it's outside, as if it's on the screen, and not in the mind to take it in. So. So that's beautiful that you have this deep desire to get to the bottom of it, and and I did a online retreat recently where I just focused so strong on this one theme that you're bringing up. I mean, really, I just really went at it the whole for all the sessions into the experience. You have to come first, even if you have the answer, it won't help you until you come first to the admission that. I have a perceptual problem. Why is that so important? It's because the mind, with the ego's advice, is saying you have relationship problems, you've got health issues, you've got financial issues, you know, you've got all these many, many, many problems. I just listen to that and I keep hearing you say stubborn, stubborn, stubborn. Yeah. I just heard that a couple of days ago. Yeah, that's like a it could be a, a stubborn re resistance or a stubborn refusal to really look at the lens. It's instead, focusing out on the, the specifics that you see through the lens. So sometimes I've re referred to it as like cracked perception, because the cracked part really is a visual, you know, like a cracked window. If you were looking through a cracked window, you know, you would really see that you need to replace that cracked window with a clear window if you're going to see clearly. But the temptation of the ego's world is to start to see the pieces and think that you need to pick up the pieces, fix the pieces, change the pieces. And, you know, that's the temptation of the mind, you know, that even there are a lot of very bright, loving, even Course in Miracles teachers that are still a bit focused on on changing the world, even though the Course itself says, seek not to change the world. It's very specific. Mm -hmm. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. That's saying, acknowledge first you have a perceptual problem, and then accept the solution to that perceptual problem, which is healed perception or unified perception. So, 
that's really a good point that you're bringing up because as long as you're not admitting that it's a perceptual problem, then there's a huge tendency to try to, you know, look for the correction wherever the correction is not. Mm -hmm. And that's why he also says, never correct a brother. That's an amazing line in there, never correct a brother, you know. Because uh, really he's, he's saying your brother is, is not the problem, it's your perception, your correct perception of your brother, of your sister, that's, that's where the error is. So I just, I do talk about that a lot and it has been very, very, very humbling to start to, to say, uh, I'm never upset for the reason I think. I'm upset because I see something that is not there. I see only the past. My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. Lessons five, six, seven, eight. That was my cadence. I'd get all worked up into, all bent out of shape and all angry and frustrated and Jesus was like, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> Never upset for the reason I think, yeah, I, you know, I, I would go through, when I really worked myself into an ego frenzy, it's a time for five, six, seven, eight. like a marching band, yeah, what, five, five, six, seven, eight, take this, yeah. oh, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it is like a, a it's a happy march of of coming back. That was before I got into rules for decision, but I, I was like doing the workbook, and I'm like, oh, I'm getting really upset here. I better give it a little five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> yeah, whatever works, you know. I I've been blessed. Jesus has sent me so many musicians, singers, songwriters, Spava among a, a line, lineage of singer-songwriters. So I've heard these lessons from the Chorus sung to me. I've been paired up with singer-songwriters on travels, uh, going back into the like early 1990s with Donna Marie Carey, some of the oh, first yeah, stuff. Beautiful. beautiful, and then just in Resta and, and mm -hmm. Helena and Spava, now with a whole new it's just like I'm being serenaded. Like Jesus is like, oh, I know you like the music, so if you mind, I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just sing you awake. Uh, and uh, and I'm like, and the same with the movies, you know. Oh, I know you like motion pictures. Well, we're going to give you your movie watcher's guide to enlightenment, so you can have some fun in this process. And that's the way, you know. The more you just are sincere in your devotion, then the things that you find helpful, get used as part of that uh, wake-up call, as part of the retranslation. Well, thank you all. It's been delightful being here with you. I'm going to go visit my friend Judy Scutch, who's the, the publisher of the course. I think she's about, I think she's 87, but she seemed to break her leg and she's in a wheelchair, so i uh, going to go give her a big hug and and just be there and but it's been such a delight being with all of you and mm -hmm. feeling all your hearts and and feeling like we're so joined together it's like we're walking together hand in hand, in hand and arm in arm mm -hmm. you know to the light and we're here to to help each other we're here to be support to each other and I feel that you know, I feel real grateful to have had this opportunity I think it's the first retreat I've ever done in a, in a, in a whole village of yurts. Like a little a yurt village. Willow. Yeah, Willow. <laughs> she pulls it in. <laughs> it's yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, and we will send out an after email after this retreat. It was all sorts of links and things to go deeper into the teachings. We, over the last, after the last 10 years, have just have been massively creating all sorts of support.